99 years ago, netball in New Zealand became the country's first national sports organisation. It was called basketball then, a nine-a-side game played on grass with baskets for goals. It went on to be a groundbreaker, setting a style of play that the rest of the world was in awe of. The beloved Silver Ferns have won our hearts. Can you believe it? It's all over! New Zealand netball stand tall! And broken our hearts over and over again. New Zealand 67-51. It has been a thumping by the Sunshine Girls. It's still the top sport for women and girls with 350,000 participants. But on the eve of its centenary, has netball lost its way? A huge milestone for Netball New Zealand coming up next year. I wouldn't go as far as saying the sport is in crisis, but I do think it's it's reached a real crossroads. And netball leaders, they need to make some bold decisions and show some real ambition for the sport if it is going to survive in another 100 years. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly, and that's RNZ's in-depth sports correspondent, Dana Johansson. Today on The Detail, what does New Zealand netball need to do to thrive for another century? What Australia have done very well, it's kind of the Hollywood effect for me. I just think they've made a league that sparkles and shines and everyone goes, I want a piece of that. And actually, there's some really good stuff going on in the UK and in New Zealand, but we haven't quite captured that appeal yet. We'll hear more from former England player and commentator Tamsin Greenway. But first, Dana on the Silver Ferns. They had such mixed results this year, a bronze at the World Cup and later an embarrassing loss to England's development side. I think that some of those competitive struggles need to be looked at in, in context of the Silver Ferns' broader history. I don't think they're any more or less competitive than they were, say, 10 or 20 years ago. The issues that, that impact the Silver Ferns more recently are the same issues that have affected them for decades, and that's the lack of depth, because we are a small nation. We don't have a lot of resource, so on that, in that respect, we punch above our weight. The bigger concern for me is that Netball New Zealand really led the way in terms of the commercialisation and professionalisation of the sport. You think back to the sort of mid to late 90s, Netball New Zealand was leading the way. It had a semi-professional women's competition, which was groundbreaking. It essentially professionalised at the same time that rugby was was taking those steps into professionalisation. But over the last five to seven years, it really feels like they've been overtaken by the likes of Australia and even England have a really strong domestic competition in place. Um, you look at what, what's happening in the ANZ Premiership space, that competition is really no different to the National Bank Cup of old in, in sort of circa 1997 to 2007. So what's happened? I think really the turning point was that split in the Trans-Tasman League in, in 2016. An interesting sports story developing this morning. It's almost certain now that Australia will pull the plug on the Trans-Tasman netball competition. Australia has been the catalyst behind the dismantling of the current setup and largely because of the lack of competitiveness from the New Zealand teams. The advent of the Trans-Tasman League was a game changer and it was... It brought new teams, new storylines, it just had more hype, bigger audiences, bigger crowds. And then our two mummies started fighting. And um, <laughs> as I say, I don't want to relitigate what went on there, but essentially Australia, um, given their competitive advantage, wanted more teams in the league. Um, and New Zealand said, that's fine, but not at the expense of ours. We still need five franchises. And they couldn't come to an agreement on the way forward. And so at the end of 2016, they, they went their separate ways. And really the two countries took quite a different philosophical approach in, in starting their new domestic competitions. Australia was really focused on securing a paid broadcast deal, which it hadn't been able to do, so it was really focused on making it the most compelling commercial and entertainment product it could. And so they made some quite bold calls and brought in some quite controversial rules, one of them being removing any limitations on imports to attract you know, the, the best players from around the world into their competition. And the other one they did was they brought in a two-point shot. First Suncorp super shot, Joe Harton. A super shot, gee, it's an important one for the fever. 
the last five minutes of every quarter, um, they have a two-point scoring zone. So if you shoot from long, that that's two points. And it creates this extra element. And it did offend the traditionalists. And it, people also worried whether it would affect them internationally because they'd go back to playing under the traditional rules. But I think as it's come to pass, as it's been a really good um, introduction to that league, and it, you hear the crowds go absolutely nuts. The big one off the head. Oh! <laughs> and sometimes it looks ugly, it looks messy, but it, it adds another level of excitement. Plus the potential to make more money, according to Diamond's legend, Kath Cox. I mean, commercially, I think it's going to do a good thing for us because it's going to keep the excitement, it keeps the game involved. And if there's more sponsorship dollars in our game, all the better for it. And as I said, it is becoming very predictable at the moment with the tall shooter. So this definitely will mix it up. New Zealand went, took a slightly different approach and they had the security blanket of knowing they had that Sky broadcast deal and Sky had been a long-term partner of theirs and really committed to women's sport. And so they kind of went back to a six-team domestic league and didn't really look at introducing anything different. So the product we have now in the ANZ Premiership, very similar to what the National Bank Cup looked like back, at, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Why have the administrators, why have the leaders of the sport allowed this to happen? Yeah, I think that is is the the hundred million dollar question. Really, mm. is that they they haven't been bold enough or ambitious enough, and kind of their key focus post that split in the league was re-establishing New Zealand netball's identity because a lot of those New Zealand franchises had got sucked into try and playing Australia's game, and that saw them sort of drop away their competitiveness and, and really lose its identity. So the kind of early years of that league, they were all about re-establishing the New Zealand way of netball. And it, to some extent, it paid off at international level. They went and won a World Cup in, in 2019. What a story! What a story! But the league just hasn't evolved from there. They haven't been bold enough in introducing rule changes. They haven't looked at what they can do to their in-game presentation. I, you know, I bring up the example of the time, even the, the Silver Ferns Australia, they played a game in Invercargill earlier this year during the Constellation Cup and the halftime entertainment was the local rock and roll club doing a dance. You kind of look at the hype and excitement in, in Australia, the, the halftime acts. Moment at 33. The competitions, the games, the big screen. Bruce, little hand on it. Getting all that sort of added fun into it. You know, mm. win or lose, you are entertained. And I think that's what Netball New Zealand really needs to take a look at. They will probably argue it's a resourcing issue, but um, I don't think they can afford not to do something new. So does this problem really come from this domestic competition, which has been a bit lacking? I think it's one of the problems, but it's not the entire issue. I just think the sport is at a crossroads and they've got those kind of internal factors, but there's external factors as well um, in that you've seen those traditional male-dominated codes like cricket, rugby and even football really invest in its women's programs. Um, they've suddenly realised there's another 50% of the population out there and decide to throw some money at it. And so while netball is still holds this kind of overwhelming advantage in terms of its participation numbers at grassroots level. It's still overwhelmingly the number one sport for women and girls. Mm. They're starting to encounter really competition to retain talent because there are now a lot more options for women and girls out there. Rugby is now on the Olympic schedule in the sevens. They've introduced a new sort of global calendar for, for women's 15s rugby. You look at the hype and excitement that the FIFA World Cup brought last year. Cricket's about to get on the Olympic schedule as well, as, as well as being a Commonwealth Games sport. So there's now a lot more opportunities and money in other sports. And so netball is about to have a real shit fight on its hands for talent. And that's where you'll start to see the sport hit crisis mode. It's not there yet, as I say, but I do think it's at a crossroads and something drastic needs to change. Speaking of the big international competitions, the future of the Commonwealth Games is very uncertain and its loss would be a huge blow to netball. Let's hear from Tamson Greenway, former England player who did a stint at Australia's Suncorp League and is now a TV commentator. I, look, I personally think it's a, it's a huge problem for netball and I'd like to think that 
Um, the major nations and World Netball are looking at this, and I'm sure they are behind the scenes to say, what do we do about this if this doesn't go ahead? You know, it's always year three in our four-year cycle. I think it's um, a scary thought when we're looking at the impact of other female sports around the world at the moment to think that we'd go every four years with a World Cup and only like our other series as, as test series that are going ahead. We don't want netball to become this elitist game where literally you've only got two or three nations competing and and things like the Commonwealth Games allow um, the African nations, the lower ranked nations to have a crack at the top teams, which they don't get to do regularly at any other point. And it gets us there on a world stage to a different audience. So I think we've got to be very mindful that the Commonwealth Games doesn't go ahead. We need to be having regular international competition that isn't just about the top two or three nations. Because I think what's been so exciting over the past probably four years is that we don't have um, a given now that it's just going to be an Oz New Zealand final and that, you know, one of them is going to come out on top. We've got, we're starting to get competition around the world, especially in those top five positions. And I think, the sport to grow globally needs to at least have that working down the rankings as well. It's interesting about England. It's had a huge injection of public funding. I mean, last year, $42 million roughly of government and lottery funding to be spent over the next five years. I think the next step for England, although the funding is absolutely amazing whenever we get that, is um, is to start linking it into this commercialisation as well. So how do we get... Um, more bombs on seats in in to watch the competitions, which the internationals are doing. We need to transfer that into the league game as well. Um, it's about how we get more viewers watching on the TV. Like, what do those TV deals look like, and where does the sponsorship come? So, I think it kind of goes hand in hand. Although funding is always amazing and greatly received, and it and it has always been good and strong for England, and we've always put up a good case. And this is why things like the Commonwealth Games help because uh, we're not in the Olympics. That there's got to be another eye on the commercialization of the sport. And I personally feel like that's where the focus has got to be. We've got to continue with our participation so we can we get the funding in and we've got that baseline. But the next step for me is is how we commercialise the game. There's a lot of talk about that here as well. You, you'll know that. And, and we look across to Australia and see with their domestic league that they seem to have nailed it uh, in terms of entertainment and getting people along, the spectator value. But we don't, I don't know, in New Zealand, we're not on top of it. I, I guess it involves a lot of money. I think, you know, each nation looks at uh, different aspects and the problems. One of the problems we have, ho- have over here is the cultural aspect. So we have a lot of uh, men and women playing the sport in our country, a lot. And our participation doesn't add up to the to the viewers. And I think that's probably been the biggest missing piece for us. How the heck do we transfer people that play every week, the millions that play every week in, in the UK, into people that watch the game? And um, we certainly haven't nailed that. And I think Suncorp have definitely done that. And I was lucky enough to be in at the beginning, you know, and, and clubs take ma- took major risks. You know, even when I joined the Firebirds, that when I first joined the season before, they were playing out in an exhibition centre out of town. They moved it into into the centre of Brisbane um, and, you know, look at them now with their own venue and and um, everything on site. So there's been massive growth and change. Um, but I think everybody's got to try and find their, their missing piece. And I'm not sure how it works in New Zealand with that, but certainly for us, our big piece is can we get participation in, in, across the viewership? And if not, who's the audience we're going after? What is that target audience? And what do we do commercially over the next few years to really, really take a crack at them? We have to point out that it's not, things aren't perfect in Australia. I mean, they've had some big battles quite recently. Liz Ellis is the former Australian captain and a legend of the game. How do you describe the state of play in netball in Australia right now? Oh, look, I would say it's parlous at best. I think that this whole pay dispute between Netball Australia and the players and the states as well, they've been involved, has been incredibly poisonous and we've seen some real toxicity play out. And I think it's been, well, from an ex-player's point of view, it's been incredibly disappointing to see the resources that have been thrown at fighting the players for what actually isn't much. Yeah, I, look, I think there's massive learnings, isn't there? Like it's by no means perfect. And I think what's been shown over the last few weeks, few months has been probably quite embarrassing for our sport across in the whole. Like, you know, you don't want to be having those inner battles between governing bodies and players and clubs and 
and I, and I think the biggest part of this is people have got to work together. I, I think personally, we're far more powerful as a brand across the board. So I'd love to see international calendars align. Everyone at the minute is fighting for their own sort of good. And it'd be like, well, hang on a second, you know, can we all work more proactively together to get better aligned calendars? So um, players can play in multi-leagues and, you know, you know is it beneficial to have um, leagues across the world that are professional that, you know, players can pick and choose to go and play in? So we we actually keep building that global brand. I think what Australia have done very well, and it's what I always say, and it, it's kind of the um, the Hollywood effect for me. So what I always talk about is, you know, people will go out there, oh, their commentators are better and their entertainment is better and their quarters are better and their kit's better. And, you know, it's all this kind of stuff. I just think they've made a league that sparkles and shines and everyone goes, I want a piece of that. And actually, there's some really good stuff going on in the UK and in New Zealand, but we haven't quite captured that appeal yet. Um, and I think that's something really important. Now, whether it's rule changes, whether it's um, whether you need a bit of controversy, what I think they've done well is is the leagues work together. I think once you get the product right and you get brand netball across the board, you get a bigger buy-in. But what about the money? Well, our top netballers are paid pretty well, but Dana says other codes are creeping closer. If you are a silver fern, you are earning in excess of $100,000, sort of between about 120, 140, which includes your franchise sort of contract along with your silver ferns contract. Rugby is currently comparable. Cricket, there's opportunities now to earn a lot more money in, in competitions like the Women's Big Bash League and the Indian competition as well. So Nibble still kind of leads the way, but it is increasingly coming under threat from those uh, those bigger codes. Once rugby, the um, Super Rugby Opiki, gets a proper competition in place beyond the, the six-week model they've got now, I think that's when rugby player earnings are going to rapidly overtake netball player earnings. And so in terms of the domestic league and also opportunities for New Zealand players, I mean, what are the restrictions on being a silver fern? So New Zealand players can play in the Australian League, but that would mean they're ineligible to represent the silver ferns unless a dispensation is granted. We saw that occur with with Laura Langman, who went over and played for the Sunshine Coast Lightning. My ultimate dream was to have an opportunity to play in Australia, and I got to play in two magnificent teams on and off the court. But even then, those kind of first few years, she was um, ruled ineligible for the Silver Ferns until Nolene Toto took over as, as coach and, and was able to put her foot down and, and <laughs> ensure that um, she was able to get Langman in the team. And we've also seen other senior players as granted dispensations like Maria Falau and Katrina Rore. But... These are kind of obviously exceptions to the rule. Netball New Zealand has been really keen to ensure that their talent remains in New Zealand and to ensure, I guess, the integrity of their own competitions and they're not losing their best players overseas. Next year, if the rumours are correct, uh, there's been a delay in, in those super netball franchises naming their teams because of this ongoing player dispute um, that's been going on over there. But from what I understand, um, Samantha Winders, um, former Magic and Steel player, she's sort of been out of favour with the Silver Fern selectors. So she's going over to try a luck in Australia and that could well be her pathway back into the Silver Ferns dress. Um, also defender, she's quite young, Ali Timu. Um, she has a couple of Silver Ferns caps under her belt. Um, she's actually moving to Australia for personal reasons. Her partner plays uh, in the NRL over there. And it looks like she'll be picked up by a team. So there's a few cases out there, but certainly most players seem to be sticking to the rule of of staying in New Zealand. Should New Zealand netball be a bit more relaxed about that and let their players go to Australia and then, you know, play there and then come back and try for the Silver Ferns? Yeah, yeah. I think it is important to point out that Netball New Zealand are not the only national body with this rule in place. Um, New Zealand Rugby also have a stipulation that players need to play in New Zealand in a Super Rugby franchise if they are going to be eligible for the All Blacks. And we've seen that debate play out time and time again, and it's even um, just erupted again after a slew of top All Blacks have have gone overseas post-World Cup. Some are returning, some just take sabbaticals and then return. Um, So I wonder if that's something that Netball New Zealand need to look at is is that idea of a sabbatical and allowing players to go over there, um, get some experience in it. Because it's not just the the 
I guess, the stronger competition over there. It's it's the training environments are completely different in Australia. Is there any chance that the, the two domestic competitions will join up again? I don't think in the short term that will happen, but I do hope those conversations occur because when the Trans-Tasman League first split, the idea was, or what was kind of pitched at the time, was that there would be some sort of crossover competition or crossover league, but um, I guess there was too much bad blood there initially for that for that to occur. Now each of those leagues are, are locked into their separate broadcast agreements, so I think those would need to, to roll around before you can look at it, but I would really love to see um, even just a couple of New Zealand franchises playing in that competition. So not just opening up willy-nilly for individual players, but actually having a presence in that league. Are they going to do it? Surely they will. (laughs) This is the opportunity, isn't it? Um, But obviously they need money to do all this too. Yeah, yeah. And the likes of England and Australia have really leaned on government, both state and federal in Australia, or lotteries money. And I don't think think that money is here in New Zealand, which is why they need to look at commercial sponsors. And the only way you're going to attract commercial sponsors is to make it a more compelling product. Yeah, it come, comes around full circle. Get, get some fresh ideas, get some decent entertainment at the games. Yeah, the in-game presentation is something I understand they are looking at. And also just potential rule changes. I don't know if they're bold enough, as Australia were, to introduce a two-point shot, but I do think there need to be some sort of variations on the rules or something that's going to allow the crowd to remain engaged and the television audience to remain engaged when it's middle of the third quarter and you're and the team's sort of 20 points ahead. How do, how do you stay engaged with the game? I read somewhere that Sky TV's broadcast deal with Netball NZ runs until the end of 2024 season. There seems to be a suggestion that the sport needs to look at going free to air. Is that an important factor here too? Yeah, I think, you know, part of... Nipple's early success, as I say, in, in terms of that professionalisation of the sport, was was having that free to air deal on TVNZ. The news will be at the six o'clock news will be on, and then straight away afterwards you'll be into a Silver Ferns test, and that's how they got huge audience numbers. I think the nineteen ninety nine World Cup they they broke records at the time for for audience numbers. So, I do think a free to air component is part of it. Sky will probably argue that they have Prime or what's now called Sky Open and they, they do show games on there, but um, that doesn't have the audience that a, that a TVNZ or a, or a News Hub does. So mm. it will be interesting to see if, if those options are considered. OK, so centenary year next year, what, what do you think needs to happen? What are the key things that need to take place? It's a really great opportunity to remind New Zealanders of the kind of role that netball has played in the development of not only women's sport, but the development of women and and the empowerment of women. Um, Netball has been huge in terms of, like, it's basically been run for decades on women's volunteer labour. And they've actually made some some pretty bold calls over the years. If you think back to in the 60s or 70s, the entire Nepal New Zealand executive basically sacked itself, recognising that they did not have the skills and ability to take Nepal into that next era. And so they um, made sure that the new constitution was set up so so there were people there that could take it into the, the new era. Real, well, Netball New Zealand really led the way in terms of the professionalisation and commercialisation of women's sport in the 90s. It was groundbreaking what they did. And I just think now they need to look at what the future holds and how they can take that next step in, in its evolution. That's all for today. I'm Sharon Brett-Kelly. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. This episode was engineered by Phil Benj and produced by Mark Jennings. Thanks to Dana Johansson and Tamsin Greenway. Mā te wā.